Hey everyone, welcome to another modern deck tech today, Teamer Tarmo Drazi. So this was one of the first, if not the first deck that ever popped up on this channel almost a year ago. Uh, maybe it's two months short of a year, more or less actually, that's kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, I posted up a, a match of Teamer Tarmo Drazi, I believe, back in the day. And yeah, just, <laughs> the channel took off ever since. So this deck has been... A favorite of mine for a long time. You know I'm a teamer player in general. I love that blue, red, and green working together. And I originally saw this deck idea posted, man, years and years and years ago by uh, someone who actually used to, uh, you know, play a lot at my local LGS, uh, Jordan Boisvert, who, you know, he posts a lot of articles on Modern Nexus and he's been playing a lot at a competitive level as well, at least he used to. So yeah, I mean, anyway. That's a, a long story. Timur Tomodrazi was a deck that he had posted up a long time ago. Obviously, it looked very different from what I've done to it, uh, at least from, from my memory. So I've definitely modified it a lot throughout the years, but I've definitely enjoyed playing with it. So I, I figured let's let's revisit Timur Tomodrazi a bit, and let's take a look at the core of that deck to start off. So, of course, Tomodrazi. Tomogoyf is definitely going to be... Uh, you know, a <laughs> four of in this deck. It's definitely a good old beater that has never really lost its pizzazz, at least with me. It's my top three favorite creatures for sure, alongside Delver of Secrets Hunt Master of Fells. So, definitely playing four Tarmogoyfs. It grows as you play, it grows as your opponent plays, and there are cards in this deck that help it grow even bigger than a normal Tarmogoyf would in another deck like Jun, for example. So definitely playing four Tarmogoyfs. It comes out earlier than your other Eldrazi's, generally speaking. Then we're playing four Thought Not Seers. A wonderful Thought Seize on a stick, I guess, in a way. Uh, when it comes into the battlefield, you uh, may look at your target, opponent, uh, target opponent's hand, essentially, and you choose a non-land card from it, and you exile it. The main downside here is that if Thought Not Seer or when Thought Not Seer uh, leaves the battlefield, target opponent draws a card. So your opponent will eventually draw a card, but the point is that you're getting a 4-4, four, four, you know, body onto the battlefield and taking out their most, you know, important spell from their hand at that time. And that's all very, very important. So Thought Not Seer is actually a great Eldrazi card to have. Reality Smasher is our big boy, bigger than Tarmogoyf sometimes. And it has Trample and Haste, and it's a 5-5. Oh, and when it gets when it becomes a target of a spell, an opponent controls, it gets countered uh, unless that controller of the spell discards a card as well. So if your opponent's going to cast a Dismember on it, or, I don't know, anything, Dreadbore, whatever it may be, they also have to discard a card, uh, which is fantastic. I, I, I love Reality Smasher. The fact that it has Haste is just... <laughs> It's kind of uh, the icing on the cake because it, it's it's an always a good uh, you know top deck. You, you sometimes you're at a board stall, you need something, and Reality Smasher comes onto the battlefield and attacks immediately. You don't have to wait an extra turn to give your opponent a chance to do something. So Reality Smasher again, awesome, awesome creature. And yeah, these are your three main creatures of this deck. Teamer, Tarmo, Draws. So let's look at the other creatures here. So we have Noble Hierarch. Of course, Noble Hierarch is here for two reasons. A, Exalted, helps out when Reality Smasher, which is already big, you know, attacks alone. It becomes a 6-6 six, six Trample, Haste, which is scary, I assure you. Uh, but it's also there to help you ramp up into your bigger creatures and to have excess mana available to you so that you can cast your, your larger spells. Sometimes you don't have all the lands that you need to accelerate your Eldrazi spells, so Noble Hierarch will help you do that. Birds of Paradise as well. It doesn't have Exalted, but it can add one of any color to the to your mana pool, essentially, so we're also playing two Birds of Paradise to kind of round out our, our ramp in this deck. And we're also playing two Huntmasters of the Fells. I know that probably looks weird to a lot of you, but I love Huntmaster of the Fells, like I said, top three. And it's also a great card to grind with. You're only playing two of here. It's not a, a central part of this deck. But I'm telling you, this has been a long-lasting meme on this channel. But the proof is, is on this channel. The average time it takes for me to win a game, the minute Huntmaster of Fells hits the battlefield and stays, is two, round, is two turns. It's about two turns. The minute, sometimes, 
our opponents just insta quit. Uh, but the average is two turns. That's how long it takes. That's how long it takes for Huntmaster to close out games. I feel it's still a very underplayed card in the current modern meta. But I play with it. I think two over perf is perfectly fine in this deck. And like I said, at least with my experience and proof of that experience, uh, it closes out games pretty quickly. All right, so let's move on to the cantrips. We're playing four Mishra's Baubles. We're not playing any Serum Visions, which is, I know, it's kind of crazy, but didn't have any room for Serum Visions. We're playing other cards instead. So Mishra's Bobble is going to do its job, of course, of helping you, you know, draw a card, work around your fetches if need be. And yeah, it also fills up your graveyard to help grow your Tarmogoyf and also help another card that we're going to get to pretty soon. So let's move on to removal. We're playing Lightning Bolt. So I used to play Tarfire uh, as well as Lightning Bolt, and the main reason I used to play Tarfire is because it was also a tribal instance, so it, it counted as an extra land, uh, extra card type in your graveyard to help Tarmogoyf grow even bigger. But with the changes I made recently to this deck, I had to cut Tarfire. I just didn't have the space for it anymore, and in its place, I've you know I put other cards instead. Uh, that you'll be seeing soon. So the only removal that we have or devoted removal that we have in this deck is Lightning Bolt as a four of and I think it's perfectly fine. You have relatively big creatures so you're not too afraid of other big creatures. Lightning Bolt is going to be good to get rid of the smaller ones or just hit your opponent's face. Permission. So we're playing four Stubborn Denial. Essentially all of your main creatures uh, apart from Noble Hierarch and Birds of Paradise and an Unflip Hunt Master Defels you know, will always, uh, or almost always, trigger Ferocious on Stubborn Denial. So essentially it becomes a one-mana counter target non-creature spell. Very, very powerful. I assure you, your opponents will not see it coming the first time around. Just, it's a guarantee. When they see Tarmogoyf and Eldrazi, they think something else is happening. They are not expecting a Stubborn Denial. So Stubborn Denial is really, really powerful in a, in a shell like this. I definitely wouldn't play without four of them. So now Ramp. So before this deck tech i was actually playing with uro but since uro is out or about to be out or might be out as of me posting up this deck tech actually uh i figured it doesn't really make sense to post up this deck tech with uro again so i got rid of uro i've made other changes to the deck and the matches that i posted up uh, although some of them have uro I actually draw Uro. I never actually cast Uro in any of those matches. They're going to be posted up later today. You're going to see there's one match where Uro is in my hand. It just stays in my hand. I never cast it. I never need to. Uh, the deck does perfectly fine without it, which is always great to see. So there are no Uros in this deck. Don't worry about it. In this place, though, I have Growth Spiral, which is, you know, Uro light, very light, but it still, it still allows you to draw a card and play an extra land on, you know, this turn, if you have an extra land in your hand, which is perfectly powerful, you know, drawing cards, very powerful in any deck, and ramping up, especially in a deck like this, is super powerful, so, you know, Growth Spiral is a perfectly fine upgrade to this deck, I wasn't playing with it, you know, last year, but I am playing with it this year, and I think it's actually, it's perfect, it's instant, it's instant speed, it's better than Explore, Grow Spirals, awesome, awesome, awesome card. Alright, so the Tutors, Ancient Stirrings. I used to play four of. Ancient Stirrings was always kind of clunky in Teamer Tarmo Drazi, mostly because there are a lot of non colorless spells in, in this deck. Whereas, you know, usually Ancient Stirrings is played in Tron decks or, you know, G Tron decks, uh, you know, where most of their cards are colorless. Here, not too many are, apart from the lands and the Eldrazi. So I've cut down the amount of Ancient Stirrings uh, to two, which I think two is fine. It's it's a healthy amount. I still have four Traverse the Elvenwalds, uh, and Traverse the Elvenwalds are really going to help you keep hands that are maybe one, opening hands that are maybe one land, uh, because you know that you're almost certainly going to get your second land drop, worst case, if you don't draw that second land on your first draw step, essentially. So Traverse does a good job early game, mid to late game. When you have Delirium, you almost always will have Delirium, uh, thanks to the different pool of spells that you're playing. Uh, you can go tutor up a Reality Smasher or a Master of Fells or whatever you need at that instant uh, in terms of a creature to get it onto the battlefield and hopefully end, end the game in your favor. So Traverse, a very, very powerful, very powerful card here. So I think Ancient Stirrings and Traverse Delvin all work pretty well together. And of course, Girl Spiral is doing its job in drawing cards and playing lands. So again, Ancient Stirrings can take a back seat in a deck like this. 
And now the lands. So the lands didn't really change too much since the last time I've played it. We're playing one breeding pool, one stomping ground. Uh, we're playing four fetches total, so it's fetch light, so not too expensive on the mana base here compared to other decks that I usually deck tech. Two wooded foothills, two scalding tarns, more than enough for, for what you're fetching for here. You're playing four Eldrazi Temples, very important. You need four in this deck to help you accelerate your, you know, your Thought Not Seers or your Reality Smashers. Yeah, so <laughs> four of you need them. Uh, you're playing four, uh, th you're, sorry, you're playing three Cripples and Forests and two Yamawaya Coasts, uh, Yavamaya Coasts, sorry. Um, these are specifically there, so these are Pain Lands. Every time you tap them for a colored mana, whatever color they produce, it deals you one damage, so they are painful, especially in a deck like this. What, why they're important is that they also produce colorless mana. You don't want to rely on one wastes uh, or a bunch of Eldrazi temples produ to produce colorless mana for you. And Birds of Paradise and Noble Hierarch do not produce colorless mana, which is why these five particular lands, plus the wastes that you're playing, plus the four Eldrazi temples, very, very important. You don't want to play too many wastes because the wastes get clunky. Uh, because then you they kind of take space for you for your other color, you know your other color producing mana, uh, your other color producing lands I should say sorry, and then it, so you start throwing away opening hands because all you have is wastes and you can't do anything the first turn, so this is why the wastes are I'm only playing one waste and I'm playing a lot more of these pain lands to help me produce color mana when I need it, um, or I just produce colorless mana when I don't need the color so. That's why I'm playing those, and then I'm playing one island, one forest, one wastes. Good enough for what we're playing here. Gives you some resiliency when you're playing against a Blood Moon deck. Hint, hint. We play a match today with Blood Moon. It gets very interesting, so yeah, stay tuned for that. The sideboard, as usual, sideboards change from one meta to another, one deck to another, one playstyle to another. This is what I ended up with at the end, but of course you can play with these numbers or play with these cards as much as you want. Through Veil of Summers. You know, still legal and modern. So as long as it's legal, you're going to be playing it when you're playing green. Very, very powerful card. Engineer Explosives. This is my favorite board sweeper, essentially. Plus, you're playing three mana, so it could be up to three CMC in terms of permanents you can target. So that's pretty useful in terms of getting rid of, let's say, another permanent you don't want, you don't, you can't easily get rid of, like a Planeswalker or an Enchantment. Or if you want to get around Chalice of the Void, which doesn't hurt you too much on a deck like this, but it still can be painful. Engineer Explosives comes in useful, or if you're just playing against an aggro deck that produces maybe a lot of tokens or just a lot of one one, uh, one CMC creatures, Engineer Explosives becomes very you know very powerful here. So I think it's actually great in a, in a, in a deck like this. Two abrades for you know dealing more you know taking care of more creatures or dealing with artifacts whichever you need in a particular matchup. So I think a braid is still a very good uh, sideboard card to have here. Um, Grafdigger's Cage. Well, we're not playing Uro anymore, so I don't have to rely on Tormod's Crypt. Grafdigger's Cage comes back in. It's perfect. We don't play over. We don't play with our graveyard in terms of actually casting anything in there. So Grafdigger's Cage is a perfect shutdown for decks that still rely on their graveyards. Three Alpine Moons. So I can't play Blood Moon for obvious reasons in a deck like this because technically we're playing four colors. So Al, you know, Blood Moon is out the window. Alpine Moon comes in for the matchups where you need to target specific lands to help shut off your opponent's strategy, whatever they're doing. It's not as good as Blood Moon, but it's the best you're going to get in a deck like this. Alpine Moon can target Valakut, for example, or it could target a particular um, Urza land, whatever it may be. It shuts those down relatively quickly and efficiently. It's only one mana, so it's easy to cast. Uh, if you draw multiple, it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world, whereas Blood Moon, if you draw multiples, it kind of feels bad. So, you know, Alpine Moon, I think, is perfectly fine in a deck like this. And I'm playing one Feed the Clan to kind of help with life gain. Huntmaster of Hells helps a bit with life gain as well in the main. If you need more life gain, Feed the Clan is going to do it. I, I would probably bump up this number if the, de if the meta becomes a bit more aggressive and a bit more blitzy, a bit more quick. You might want to up the power, uh, up the life gain cards in your deck to kind of keep up. Last but not least, the matches. So let's get to combo here. When it comes to spell-based combo, you're going to be kind of weak. Stubborn Denial does help. The fact that you're playing blue does help, which means if you start seeing a lot of storm decks or a lot of spell other spell-based combo decks, you might want to start packing in more permission in the sideboard or even in the main, uh, you know, playing around with whatever composition of cards you already have there. But generally speaking, you're going to just hope you have the right Stubborn Denial <laughs> at the right time to, to deal with your opponent. 
uh, or just have the proper you know rollout of creatures to you know get a thought not seer out get one of their main cards out, uh, get one of their main combo pieces out of their hand and then a reality smasher comes down finishes them off in a few turns that's your ideal but yeah not the best matchup when it comes to creature based combo or non spell based combo let's say like primeval titan decks you're a bit better off you can disrupt their early game alpine moon is going to be a card you're going to lean on quite heavily but again the amount of permission that you have in the main uh, or even in the side is going to be limited so i wouldn't say it's your best matchups but i would much rather play primeval titan decks all day than storm decks all day with a deck like this let's just put it that way when it gets to aggro so aggro can be tricky that's for sure if you decide to keep a slow hand or all you get is a slow hand even when you mulligan they can get up under you pretty quickly now you do have removal in the main and you can bring in more removal from the side and that'll help you in games two and three which means your game which means your game one is going to be a bit more difficult against a lot of aggro decks doesn't mean you're going to lose i mean you can still get out an early tarmogoyf which will be big enough to block their main creatures might stall out the board and that'll be in your favor because the longer the game goes on and the more you you know draw more removal spells and permission spells to get rid of their burn spells or whatever it may be things slowly get into your favor but again it's going to be it's going to definitely going to be a, a coin toss in game one game two and game three things get a bit better Huntmaster Defels, believe it or not does actually help you out a lot there big mana decks mostly tron in this case or l you know death and taxes is not really a big mana deck but let's just stick to tron tron variants so you have summer now again you're you're playing blue so you can hopefully have at least one to be able to counter one of their planeswalkers apart from that though if you're playing an eldrazi tron deck you're not too concerned because you're also playing eldrazi in fact you're playing more or less the same eldrazi's they are so you're gonna be able to trade one for one or at least stall out the board a bit until you get to your other creatures or maybe just you know grind them out with huntmaster defels whatever it may be you can go toe to toe with an Eldrazi Tron deck. Don't keep, keep in mind you also have a Noble Hierarch, which gives you Exalted, which means you could even get a bit bigger than the Eldrazi that your opponents are playing. So that's all relevant there. You do have Alpine Moon on the side to be able to target their Urza lands or whatever other lands are going to be, you know, giving you a lot of trouble. I wouldn't say it's a very good matchup, but I would say it's definitely uh, at least a 50 50 at a starting point, which is better than a lot of other decks I've deck teched here in the past when it comes to big mana decks. So not magic. I mean, yeah, it is what it is. If you have an explosive start, you could get you know big Eldrazi's out early. Maybe you can win because your creatures are relig are relatively gonna have big bodies. So unless your opponent goes all nuts and has six creatures on the battlefield turn two or turn one, which does happen sometimes with not magic, uh, you can probably you know last a bit and maybe you know kill them out if they stall a bit. It's possible in game one. Game two, you're gonna heavily. In game two and three, you're gonna heavily rely on Graf Digger's Cage, of course. But I think it's a, a, a winnable match, but it really depends on how explosive they get. And honestly, that's true for most decks you're going to play against Dredge. Luckily, not a lot of people play Dredge because it's an annoying deck, uh, maybe even to the pilots. So, you know, it's not something you're going to see too often, but I do keep it there because it's kind of like a, a, special, a special archetype or special type of deck. You could put even other random decks in there that you might face where it's a coin toss. So control, how do you do against control? Well, you do have quite a bit of threats, so your you know your your control opponent's gonna have to deal with them as they come onto the battlefield. Uh, you know, if they're playing Lightning Bolt to try and get rid of your creatures, it's not gonna be the best thing in the world. Path to Exile, although it might suck, you know you're gonna have basics to go fetch. It's gonna help you ramp into your next Eldrazi creature, your next Eldrazi spell. So it's not the end of the world here. Um, you know, if your opponent goes and gets a Batter Skull. To create a to create a four four germ token or whatever it is, it's not the end of the world because again you're playing relatively big creatures. Even your Tarmogoyfs can get big really quickly. So I feel like your control matchups, at least as of today, are not that bad. You can deal with control relatively well. You do have Summer Denial. You do have Veil of Summer in the in the sideboard as well, and Graph Digger's Cage, all all of which attack you know help keep control at bay. So I think you have all the tools at your disposal to have a relatively good matchup against Control, actually, which is actually pretty cool for a deck like this. And then when it comes to mid-range. So mid-range decks, I feel, are, you know, in your favor oftentimes. Again, 
things can get away from you. They might thought seize you early. They might inquisition you early. And they might get rid of your perfect plan. And, but that's, again, true for most decks playing against mid-range decks, you know, Jun decks or or Rakdos mid-range decks, whatever it may be, uh, you know, whatever might be going around in your meta. But generally speaking, you have big creatures. You put a lot of pressure on them. The biggest creatures that they usually play are Tarmogoy, sometimes Grimag Angler, but not that often. So if their biggest creature is Tarmogoy, you're almost always going to have something bigger to deal, you know, to deal with them. So I think overall, your matchups against against mid range are pretty pretty good, and I've had good matchups against them as well. So yeah, I think mid range mid range decks are easy peasy. I wouldn't say easy peasy; that's a bit too far, but relatively easy to deal with once you put in enough repetition with this deck and you know how this deck works. And that's it for the matchups, that's it for Teamer Tarmo Drazi, so let me know what you think. This deck did pack Uro before, like I said, there's three matches going up today, and at least one of them, there's an Uro that's in my hand, but I never cast it, I never cast Uro in any of the games that I played, that I'm posting up today. And, you know, just to make it clear, because I'm pretty sure Uro's gonna get banned any day now, or any, or any hour, actually, uh, at this point, but... Yeah, it's, I'm very happy that Timur Tarmadrazi is able to stand on its own, even without Uro. I, I've been taking Uro out of all my decks ever since that really odd ban announcement was made last week. Um, and Timur Tarmadrazi was something I was concerned about, but no, actually it does swimmingly, swimmingly without Uro. Uh, which is great because it existed before Uro existed anyway, so I'm kind of happy that you know it's still viable in a meta like this. So... I really think you'd have a lot of fun with this if you enjoy playing with Tarmogoyf and you enjoy playing with Eldrazi, but you don't want to play in a colorless deck because colorless decks can get boring, let's be honest. Uh, here you have three colors, technically four, to play with. There's a lot of fun, and yeah, let me know what you think in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed the video, please give a thumbs up. If you enjoy my content in general, please subscribe, hit notification bell, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, all that stuff. You know, it really helps me out a lot. It takes a few seconds for you, but for me, it makes a big, big difference. Uh, if you were interested in becoming a patron, share out the Patreon link in the description of this video. Join my ever-growing Patreon community. My patrons are great. They give me a lot of ideas. And the way I've set up my tiers is I give you back some of your patronage at the end of every year uh, in the form of non-bulk rares and mythics. I deliver them right to your door. So essentially, you win a giveaway every year uh, just by being a patron. There's more information on Patreon. Thanks, and have a good one.